Hey, um, hi everyone. Thanks a lot for the chance to um, get a new updates about what's going on in condo insulators. Um, we, we, this, this system, we start learning about that in the past 10 years. It's just getting more and more fascinating. Um, um, again, this is a good chance to chat. Um, let me try to go through my, um, my, 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 uh, my view and uh, showing our data. We look at the quantum oscillations. We keep pursuing what happens with this kind of um, interesting insulator. And we were able to see oscillations in magnetization first, and then confirm in a different kind of insulator, YB12, we start the oscillation in resistivity, even in the raw data. Um, so the, um, before I go on, um, I really need to acknowledge the wonderful collaboration throughout the community. Um, many of you guys are here, um, and in particular, the new progress is really possible uh, with Professor Iga's uh, Web 12 sample. That's the new sample that we are able to see the oscillations in resistivity. All right, so the real players are my postdocs and students, and they are showing here. All right, okay, so SMB6, right? Um, again, I'm not going through the detail here. Um, we have already Suchitra and Colin for their wonderful talks. Um, what we see here is we see something from the um, rare earth elements and the boron put together. They have this simple cubic structure and they have nice crystals. Resistivity wise, um, our colleague um, uh, Charlie had this interesting measurement of resistivity showing the divergence resistance, but at low enough temperature, we start to see this plateau, right? So there's a lot of debates about what's going on. Here is another measurement of R versus T for resistivity uh, with a covalent disk geometry. But bottom line is you see the resonance. Um, let me try to make it to be a, all right. You see the divergence of resistance by already almost four of those magnitude, even below 20 Kelvin. And such behavior turns out comes from the hybridization, which leads to a small gap. For whatever reason, the chem potential sits inside a gap. That's where this divergence happens. But of course, big question is what happens and very low temperature. Where is the plateau? Uh, Where's that plateau coming from? All right. Again, let me emphasize that the correlation between the uh, internal electrons and the localized electrons seems to give the gap. Um, there's not much magnetic property happening at very low temperature by non-magnetic. There are, of course, uh, local moments. There are, of course, paramagnetic states. Um, but magnetic ordering, at least from the data we see above a Kelvin, it does not seem to go there. Maybe at a very low temperature, particularly the progress we just heard about uh, from the uh, from USR sounds very interesting. All right. Now about the plateau, there's all kinds of debate, but um, the, 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 the field gets really hot, of course, after the prediction from Pierce and, and many of others suggesting that there might be a topological protected service state, right? And the magically experimental work came to show something really promising. My colleague, Charlie, invented a new way to measure the non-local transport. Similar like the non-local transport for two-dimensional electrons, like in gallium arsenide, right? Here, they are inventing a way to try to measure the non-local measurements with a mixed geometry. And to, and to the first order, they show the resistivity versus temperature has a completely profile of temperature dependence. So no matter what interpretation would be, it says the electrical transport is very anisotropic when sample turns into the plateau states, when resistivity pla turns into plateau states, right? Of course, similar work is repeated from uh, the Irvine group and the, the point of contact spectra from, uh, from, from the Maryland group also shows something really interesting there. Um, quickly, the, exper uh, the, the experiments, um, 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 there, there also uh, experiments lead to the theoretical predictions, as well as with the expectation, what happens to the Fermi surface. So, so we are set to try to look for the Fermi surface. Of course, there are many interesting experiments um, 
coming out of this uh, peer learning works. Um, I'm not having all the lists there. I'm trying to focus on quantum oscillations, the key topic here for our uh, for, for this series. Um, so from our work, from Suchi's work, which you just heard, and later from the uh, from the Los Arms group, um, there's different patients and different features coming out. But the key missing feature, as I, I as, as I see, is the missing of quantum oscillations in resistivity. So this is our best effort of measuring the resistance for the for, uh, up to 45 Tesla for SMB6. We use Corbino disk geometry to try to limit our transport on, on top surface. Um, best polished sample up to 45 Tesla, we see almost nothing, right? Um, the, the negative magnetic resistance is well reproduced in all other samples, but take the derivative trying to look for free transform does not seem to give us any oscillation at all, right? This is very discouraging, but what we what we try to solve the problem, go from the resistivity now to try to measure the magnetization of the surface. This motivates us to look for the torque response of the sample. I'm not claiming 100% that this response comes only from the surface, but this is how we think about that. We try to measure the moment from the surface and look for what's going on. And in this result, what we, what, 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 in, in the two we are doing there, we try to measure magnetic torque by applying samples of field on, and on a floppy cantilever and the deflection would give us some um, direct measurement of torque and the effect of magnetization, which is, by the way, because it's M cross B, this is only sensitive to magnetic and solid field. Um, that's the cartoon sample, and this is a real sample, um, not really SMB6, but a, um, a business sample sitting on a floppy tenor lever. And to show you how the typical setup is, the sample sits on the tenor lever with a, with a small vacuum in between. We can try to measure the capacitance between the metallic tenor lever and the gold film underneath to show you how um, to, to, to try to find, find a small deflection. All right. Okay. Um, so, so resolution wise, um, these are typical numbers we put there. Um, I know this number may not make, make much sense to many of the audience there. I just try to emphasize that by doing more and more, uh, pushing the sensitivity further and further. Now we are, we, we can do the measurements up to 65 Tesla going really broad temperature range. And resolution-wise, now it's, uh, it's it's even even better than the number I quoted here. So it's it's millions or billion times now better than the commercial available magnetometer. I also put a penny there to show you the typical size we have here. Uh, well, um, so so typically this is a few millimeters, and also have a penny here to show how cheap we are. We just make tons of them and try to tailor our tool for our to, for our samples. All right. So, so the key results I'm going to talk about either coming from our own lab or coming from hybrid data. There are some, a few slides we will show coming from Paul's lab facility, which typically I'm not allowed to take pictures, um, but okay. Um, all right, so what do we expect? We expect to see a paramagnetic response where the magnetization is slightly polarized by H, right? So for the torque feature, as a product M cross H, roughly speaking, this linear dependence should give, give us quadratic dependence. So that is what we expect, at least near zero field. That's indeed what we saw near zero field. The quadratic dependence tells us that this is down to 300 mini Kelvin. We're not yet seeing anything magnetic order. Um, this is torque versus H and high enough fields. Now you see that we see weak oak wiggles and and large wiggles. And we see a bunch of different oscillations putting together. And that this is a torque. Here we are plotting M versus H uh, up to 45 Tesla. And, and again, and low in our fields, this is linear dependence. And 300 mini Kelvin, we see a paramagnetic like response. And high in our field, we see sets of slow wiggles, fast wiggles, even beating pattern of fast wiggles which indicates that um, we must have a set of different frequencies. Just, I'm just naming slowest alpha, um, middle one beta, um, then the gamma term. 
and try, we try to carry out for many, many different angles to build up a spectrum and then analyze the angular dependence. For our data, since we look at only the dominating feature, and we seem to find out that the gamma beta pockets, as well as other pockets, both keep the wall causing angle dependence, which is consistent with a almost cylinder-like Fermi surface, right? So this kind of two-dimensional Fermi surface, when we first reported this, we thought this would be an indication of quantum oscillations coming from surface states. All right, let me emphasize again that this is a one of cost angle dependence with the minimum here aligned with zero and 90 degree. In this, uh, in our geometry, this means the field is either along the C axis or A axis, whereas beta pocket, the minimum is along the 45 degree or 135 degree. Again, our data seem to indicate that we have cylinder-like two-dimensional from surface. Are they bulk or are they, uh, are they uh, surface states from surface? Um, that's an open question that I'm going to try to address next. But our first data tells us that we have something with the long axis point to different directions. One is along the C or A axis, the other along the 0, 1, 1 direction. All right, okay, of course, a year after our report, Suchidra reported this beautiful observation of quantum oscillations, not only in the same frequency range, the dominating feature that we observe, but also their group re report this nice pattern in much, much larger pocket size, right? Um, let me try to give some comparison. Here, we are looking at something in order of 300 Tesla, 400 Tesla, which is like probably one or 2% of the gluon zone, right? Whereas if you look at something in the order of 10 to four Tesla, then these pockets will be in the order of full size of gluon zone. That's just like what you expect observing noble metals like copper or silver and, and, and many others, right? So it's a very interesting result. And a big question coming out of this right away is, are we seeing the bulk from surface or are we seeing the, the, the surface state from the surface? So that's a very big question. Um, let me, um, I don't have the slides here, but uh, I don't have much more slides here, but so far our data focus on the floating zone ground with um, um, SMB6, which is uh, which typically coming from aluminum flux. So there's a natural question to see the role of aluminum and see what happens. The slides I did not show was in our very first report, we did compare our oscillation pattern with the oscillation pattern of pure aluminum flux. And we find even, we, we, we did observe oscillations of aluminum, but their pocket size, their dominating frequency is much different from what we saw. Of course, this beautiful work from the Los Arms group reported some additional frequencies that's consistent with some other peaks happening in the uh, in the flask row samples. Uh, again, I think I think um, I think Sutra made an interesting point, right? To compare the features, it's best to compare the most most of the features together. What's going on with one or two branches together? That's open question. Of course, um, the lost arms from 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 Priscilla. Uh, they're, they're nice to share us the samples. Indeed, in their polished, mechanical polished samples, we did not observe quantum oscillations, but we start to observe hysteresis um, at quite, quite pronounced hysteresis. And re recall that in the, uh, in the early slides, we, 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 our best effort did not observe any ma magnetic ordering at all, but here with the polished samples, we seem to observe some hysteresis pattern. I think there are some open question that about what's the role of growth, what's the role of sample preparation, and we need to understand that. A few slides, a few slides. So, so yeah, so 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 I think we should do something together and try to understand the role of ordering. But but um um but 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 something I did not get a chance to prepare is the following. Um, I um. Colin um, just gave the beautiful talk about what's going on when they try to dope intentionally 
of a garden inside and see what happened there. I did work with him. I also worked with uh, with, with um, Jean Pierre to try to get with, with JP about their iron dope or um, um, nickel dope um, SMB6 and see what happens. To my to our surprise, the quantum oscillation is still there with their um, small doping SMB6. How to interpret that and what's going on there? That's, that's again, a very interesting question that we should work together and try to find out, find out what's going on. All right. Okay, sorry. I think Priscilla Rosa has a question yes. or a comment. Please. Priscilla, do you yeah. want to make a clarification question? Yeah, I, I'm a little confused. I just wanted to clarify. I, I, I think if I understood you correctly, Luli, you mentioned that, that our results um, uh, observed um, additional oscillations that were consistent with floating zone samples, and, and that is incorrect. So I just wanted to clarify that. Our main result is that in polished samples that were polished to remove aluminum, there are no quantum oscillations. Uh, so in flux grown samples. Uh, so that was the clarification. Thank right. you. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I should be careful about that. So, yeah. So, aluminum flux sample from both aluminum flux uh, measurements from, from all three groups uh, seems to give consistent results. Um, the work from Suchidra finds that um, the aluminum flux samples, the dominant feature, is consistent with the floating zone grown samples. All right. We also had floating zone grown samples from, uh, from Joss Hopkins group. And we, from, from some samples, we did observe certain kind of wiggles, but the oscillation amplitude is way smaller than the aluminum flux samples. So it's inconclusive to make any angular dependence argument there. So that would be my statement. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Priscilla, for the clarification. All right, so now um, the field gets really interesting, right? Because um, we are we we think we are observing a topological protected surface state quantum oscillation there. Now there's discussions or evidence maybe Bok is doing something, and there's all kinds of proposals, either quite exotic proposals or something still based on the Fermi liquid theory and trying what's going on. I, I, this is definitely not a uh, complete list. Um, there's, um, 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 I, I, I just say that uh, Professor Varma uploaded uh, his talk about, uh, about how to understand quantum oscillations. I believe Patrick will also have something uh, to say about how to understand quantum oscillation along these lines. But, um, but to me as experimentalists, right? Um, I want to understand experimental features first. I think we need to work together to figure out the, the roles of sample growth and how, and how to understand the oscillation pattern from experiments first. So the very first challenge is to understand whether the oscillation comes from bulk or surface, right? The, the, the most, um, um, the most, uh, the, the, the most um, straightforward way, as many of you suggested, would be do the measurements by limiting the sample volume, right? Have one sample polish and try to measure again and try to measure that. In past six years, we have been that, doing that for many, many rounds. It's a not a simple way since each term we need half a year, year to go back to do more measurements. As a result, our control measurement um, by, by chance comes from following. We're able to have a sample that's really ugly. But ugly, I mean that they have or some small rough surfaces on one side or some large or maybe clean surface on the other side. And, 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 and it's, it's in regular sample. And we know that even the in regular sample, the ball crystalline feature must be the same as other samples. The only difference, of course, is sample shape as well as the sample surface area, right? We were able to track the quantum oscillation down to 40 mini Kelvin up to 45 Tesla using the portable dual fridge in hybrid magnet in Tallahassee. Um, so, so what's what's our observation? Our observation is the quantum oscillation frequency versus angle is still repeating the pattern that what we expected out of the bulk 
or out of the crystal structure, which means there's a full force symmetry as what we are rotating away from the crystalline 100 to 101 and 001. So in that way, we should observe the full force symmetry and we did observe full force symmetry from the quantum oscillation frequencies. Uh, this is a consistent with both the bulk and surface scenario because no matter what, the crystalline symmetry determined that the orbital size should be should follow the symmetry. What puzzled us right away was the amplitude. When we look at the oscillation amplitude of, again, let me emphasize the dominant feature beta here, right? Again, this is a feature that, uh, I'm sorry, um, that, that Priscilla observed in their sample, but this is a feature, it seems to be gone when they polish to very thin samples, right? Focus on that feature, when we look at the oscillation amplitude, to our surprise, this oscillation amplitude seemed to break the symmetry, seemed to break the full fold of crystalline symmetry. In one orientation, it's bigger. In the other orientation, it seems to be smaller. All right. When we try to understand the pattern, we find out that such angular dependence can be modeled by assuming a simple LK model based on the Fermi liquid theory and assuming a cylinder-like Fermi surface. In other words, the only assumption there is the mass goes as one of cos angle dependence. All right, let me emphasize again that since we push down to 40 millikelvin in this flat grown sample, even down to 40 millikelvin, we still observe a conventional temperature dependence for, for the oscillation amplitude. All right. So that's the that's first feature, right? We see, we see the oscillation amplitude that seems to break the bulk symmetry, right? What does this mean? Do they mean a 100% surface or they mean a strange behavior? Um, to me, that means to understand the oscillation pattern, we have to consider how the surface affects the bulk, right? Exactly what to do and how to think about that. I, like to learn from you guys how to think about oscillation amplitudes. Now, the other puzzle really came from oscillation with, with no oscillations observed in resistivity in SMB6. Um, this is our effort. My colleague, uh, Charlie Kodak, pushed a measurement up to 100 Tesla and no oscillations at all, right? Um, to me, as an experimentalist, I'm never satisfied to say no, absolutely no, right? Um, it, for our field, usually it's hard to set the upper limit to see a no results. And, and, and so, so in other words, we still need to go for the better device and to see if there's any oscillation pattern coming into the resistivity in SMP6. Maybe not being resistivity, maybe either using the PDO method, maybe use the thermoelectric tools and see, look for the features. I'm still open for that. But to me, the way to really, another way to think about the problem is to look for a condo insulator to be, even better, a topological condo insulator to see that what happens if your gap closing magnetic field is within the range of what we achieve. So in other words, we try to understand the oscillation is charge or charge neutral. The first way to answer is really need to find out some condo insulators with, with maybe narrow gap, maybe a smaller gap closing field, right? So again, as I, as I said, right? Uh, uh, my, my colleague Charlie pushed the measurements high enough, nothing seemed to happen. And the gap closing field seems to be really, really, really high. Based on his data, it's even be, beyond 100 T or, or more. So whereas, uh, oh, 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 well, we tried many compounds, um, five, four, different counter insulators. Eventually we, we, we find out this compound might be the best because there were already existing data saying that up to 40 or 50 Tesla, there might be a gap closing already. So we were able to work with um, uh, um, Matsuda's group and work together with Professor Iga's group and get the floating zone samples of YB12. We find out the sample is actually even better the SMP6. So this is different from what uh, Suchitra reported in her, in, in her talk. Um, 
she mentioned in the discussion session that the resistivity versus low temperature resistivity versus high temperature resistivity, the ratio is not as good as SP6. Maybe it's like 10, maybe like 100. For the samples we were getting from our Japanese collaborators, Professor Iga, it's wonderful. As you can see from the room temperature to the base temperature, for the bad sample, we are seeing more than five orders of magnitude increase of resistivity. In other words, when we look at the R versus T, the temperature dependence of resistivity, I find out, I, I hardly can tell the difference between YB12 and SMP6. When we look at this behavior and push to high enough magnetic fields, no matter it's zero field up to 45 Tesla, later you'll see up to 65 Tesla, oh, I'm sorry, up to 45 Tesla. I'm still seeing a activation behavior from three Kelvin to base temperature. Even at 45 Tesla, I'm seeing two orders of magnitude increase of resistivity, right? The quantum oscillation is still there when we measure magnetic torque. Here is in Tallahassee, Florida, when we are able to observe three to four sets of wiggles and, and uh, above 35 Tesla. But most interesting feature comes from the, from the resistivity study. When we measure the sample resistivity versus magnetic field, now we clearly see the oscillation pattern in the raw data. Let me emphasize that typical resistance we are observing here and base temperature is, oh, sorry, here's the resistivity. It's, it's not a good comparison. So the oscillation of the resistivity is about, it's about a few percent of the zero field resistance, right? zero field resistivity. And it's clearly saying in the raw data, we do not need to subtract any background. All right. And, and this is what happens in hybrid uh, up to 45 Tesla. Moving to pulse field facility, we're able to study how the oscillation pattern change with temperature. Again, as you can see, below 45 Tesla, lower temperature, higher resistivity, which is again indication of we're still in the semiconductor like states with the activated gap. Above 45 or 46 Tesla depends on different samples and high enough temperature, I'm sorry, high enough field, there is no temperature dependent resistivity at all. So that indicates that maybe we're going to metallic states. Um, here is a temperature dependence like emphasized in high enough temperature, um, we seem to have very little magnetic resistance. I'm going to refer to um, um, my collaborator, John Singleton's talk about what happens in the metallic state exactly in the magneto resistance. Here was our very early effort to see what happens. And then let me emphasize that we're able to see oscillations in resistivity in the insulated states. And we're able to also observe the oscillation in the metallic states. And as she was reported, our data also indicates something very different. Um, the pattern is really much, much, either much larger orbital size or much different orbital size. Again, I would refer you to the John's talk to really see how the patterns seem to evolve as the functional magnetic fields. All right. Okay. Finally, there's temperature dependence. We're able to extract the mass. So as, as what I try to emphasize, there's mass coming from oscillations in magnetization. There's a mass coming from oscillation from resistivity. Even though their oscillation frequencies are more or less close, their, their amplitude is very, the, the mass is very different, right? Um, John mentioned in his, um, uh, in his chat that tomorrow, uh, well, in the slides, he's going to bring some discussion about what's origin of the mass difference. Please look at his talk. All right. The temperature, the angular dependence, again, let me emphasize, given size of three wiggles, this difference is probably not, probably within uncertainty, right? The, the angular dependence seems to be very different, right? So again, we are reporting the dominant feature that we can observe without doing much FFT, Fourier transform, right? But for the future, really we should work together, get a bad sample and try to cover the broad range of field broad range of temperature 
and broad range of angle to really map the farming surface of uh, what's going on in this condo insulator. All right. Um, um, my um, UG reminded me that um, we should say a few words about the, their, their measurement of thermal conductivity, where they measure the cup XX and plot cup, cup XX versus over T versus T square. And to our surprise, well, it seems to indicate that even in the zero, zero Tesla, there's a finite intercept here. So there seems to be a gapless feature, even without magnetic fields. All right. Of course, this is what happens in, in YB12 through the chat feature. I think there's a lot of debate about what happens in the thermal conductivity in SMB6. I'll leave that to the discussion. Okay, let me just stop here by seeing that now we observe oscillations in both resistivity and magnetizations in one condo insulator. And to me, as experimentalists, I know the interpretations, there are many interpretations coming in. But to me, this is, this is our effort from experimental side, try to search for the phenomenon. We may debate about the origin, but let's try to just clarify what's going on, going on experimentally. And we are seeing the oscillation resistivity. We are seeing the oscillations follow the LK formula, which to us, that indicates the phenomenon must be Fermi-like, right? Must come from Fermi. All right. Let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Lou. So uh, if anyone has questions, please please raise your hand now and I'll... Okay, it looks like Patrick is the first hand up. Patrick Lee, do you wanna uh, go ahead and unmute yourself? Okay, uh, I have quick hands. Uh, just a, for clarification. Uh, so in, in SMB6, uh, if the oscillation is from just a surface layer, is there enough um, to explain the amplitude? I thought the amplitude is very large. This is a very good question. Um, just, so, so in our best effort, just from one unit cell, um, assuming it's a, hung, it's a perfect two electron gas, we are able to get a comparable size with what we are observing. However, the big question, like what Suchitra presented there, right? For this guy, it's challenging to think it's a perfect two electron gas without, after consider scattering, after consider single smearing, we may not be able to repeat the exact that large of oscillation amplitude based on model of one unit cell and the surface. Um, again, this is a very good question. This is the reason why we try to do the control experiments to understand what's going on in different sample shape or in different sample volume. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I think I'm going to let Suchitra answer this now because I know she had a question. She has a comment. Um, yeah, sorry. I just noticed some questions in the chat and what Patrick asked as well. So I want to make it really clear. All the results on SMB6 presented here were on aluminum prox grown SMB6 samples. And all the results presented in the previous talk were floating zone samples not grown from an aluminum flux. Uh, Sean and Priscilla had comments in the chat and Pierce had a question as well um, about what our view is on the aluminum um, uh, results. So I think that um, what Sean and Priscilla have shown, um, and I think it's very interesting results that they've brought to our attention that in the 500 Tesla range of low frequencies, it is, and as I showed in my talk, the aluminum frequencies and the angular dependence are very similar to that of SMB6. And so we agree that this causes a problem with trying to disentangle whether the oscillations are from aluminum or from SMB6 if you only look at the 500 Tesla range. Um, so we have chosen to focus on the floating zone samples, which show a range of oscillations up to 10,000 Tesla. So um, I think it's really important to clarify that the results in this talk showing surface oscillations, et cetera, are all from aluminum flux grown samples. And um, there is um, a distinction in the entire range of frequencies observed up to 10,000 that we observe only in floating zone samples without any aluminum. Let, let me quick comment on that. Um, so, so, so uh, sorry, I made um, my, um, I did not clarify what I meant there, right? 
So I believe Suchitra made a great point that her sample, the her um main the very first um report focused on the floating zone sample. And there seems to be indications um, um they, 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 there's reports of very large surface uh, firm surface volume and beautiful data there. Um I I try to I try to follow her argument saying that the comparison between one branch of her spectrum with the aluminum seem to match does not mean that the other branch should match with the aluminum. Um, in my discussion, I would like to see the similar similar feature, right? If it's aluminum, it's you should have a fingerprints of a few different branches. And even from aluminum growth SMB6, there's fingerprints of few different branches. They do not seem to match exactly for all the branches, right? That's that's the first point I try to try to follow, try to argue following Sushitra's uh, discussion. It can still come from the role of aluminum putting into the aluminum flux growth samples. This is the reason why we're looking for flux growth samples coming from other flux. Uh, and see what happens there, right? I'm open to all the interpretation. What I'm trying to say that we should think, we should try try to match all the features together. The other one is really, if it's coming from impurity aluminum, why should oscillation amplitude in different orientations give different results? If it's a bulk feature coming from block aluminum inside, why? This way and the other way give a different pattern. That's that's the other pattern I got got confused. Again, I'm open to all the interpretations. Let's try to figure out what's going on here. What's going on in these samples together? Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. So let's do Colin first and then Baskaran. Uh, very nice talk, thank you. Uh, and um, I I wanted to have this pass this point by you. So you have observed quantum oscillations in torque magnetometry. So that's uh, typically called the husband alpen signal. Um, the charge transport is pretty convincingly shown to be associated with the surface in that temperature range that you're looking at. So is there, is there not an argument that observing uh, oscillations in the magnetization, but not in the charge transport at the surface, that this actually shows that the oscillations in magnetization cannot come from the surface? Well, um, again, I think this is a good argument. My, 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 my reluctance is always falling, right? Whenever we have a 2D electron gas, we may not have a clean enough 2D electron gas to give quantum oscillations, right? So um, I'm willing to think through the discussion, the, the logic you have here, to think this is a bulk phenomenon, but I need to make sure that the mobilities of that surface layer from other measurements is high enough to exclude any quantum oscillation pattern. So, um, so that, that would be my reluctance there for SMB6. For WebV12, this is a completely different story. Both transport and magnetization gave oscillation and their pattern seems to be consistent at least. Okay, uh, Bhaskaran, why don't you ask your question next? Uh, Luli, nice talk. Uh, so my question is about uh, Ethereum uh, B12. Um, there seems to be no issue of oscillations coming from surface in this system because the topological nature of quantum insulator is more complex if it is there in Ethereum. Is that correct? Or what's your feeling about surface contribution for Ethereum B12? This is again very good question. Um, there's there were indication there were reports from photo emission of existence of the topological protect surface states, even though the reports seems to be consistent with a um, what's the best way to say that the the, the counting of firm surface indicates that it's a it's a topological counting insulator, not a crystal insulator. So um, I'm still lost about the role of surface state there from based on photo emission data. Now, from my data, the 
result, the, again, this is a um, dominant feature with three wiggles. Um, the best model seems to still give us a cylinder-like Fermi surface for the husband Alpha effect. However, as, as I put the caveats there, right? We have three wiggles or four wiggles, not a complete angular dependence. We cannot exclude other angular dependence that points to the ball, right? So, um, so, so, so I will leave that question open and we'll try to understand what's going on later once we're able to map the angular dependence of amplitude and once we try to find other ways like um, maybe like a calling suggested, try to try to see how the surface gets damaged or comparing the feature and, and try to exclude a pattern about surface contributions. We had effort to go for WebV12 and this is working with gym analytics, working with um, basically a student from Masuda's group, try to go for much, much thinner sample with FIB and try to see what happens there. I think the, 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 the so I, I don't have the data in hands right here, but, but I think the dominating feature seems to suggest that the low field resistance versus thickness indicates that resistivity still comes from the surface contribution. High enough fields, when the oscillation should happen, it does not seem to happen for, for those devices, indicates that oscillation comes from the ball, from the resistivity. Um, I will, so if you guys have any question about that, talk with um, uh, Yuji Matsuda and they have nice paper prepared for that. Thank you.